right, so that's where we left off the other day. Um, so just a reminder that the Williamson ether synthesis um, is the process that we used for that was that we started with an alcohol and then we deprotonated the alcohol. And then we used that deprotonated alcohol as a nucleophile in an SN2 reaction. Right, so the, the whole idea was that we were then, we needed to have an alkyl halide that our deprotonated alcohol could attack. So it's, it's just giving a, a fancy name to something we already know how to do. We've already seen it deprotonated alcohols act as a nucleophile since last quarter, right? This is just putting it in a specific context and saying, hey, this is how you make an ether. Um, and we can reverse that as well, although it doesn't go exactly backwards when we do that. Um, if we if we heat an ether with a strong acid, um, we can wind up going through what's called acidic cleavage. So we're gonna cleave the ether in half and we're gonna replace the oxygen bond with a, um, with a halide in both cases, with whatever is attached to our strong acid. So, why don't you guys, as a warm up, try drawing this mechanism? If you have a strong acid, what's the first thing that's going to happen to an ether? And see if you can see if you can draw this, and then and then we'll go through it. All right, so the overall process is start by any time you have excess strong acid, anytime that acid is involved, um, you can assume that one of the first things that's going to happen is you're going to protonate whatever's there that can be protonated. In this case, protonate the oxygen, and that makes that gives us a good leaving group, which could then go through an SN2 or an SN1 reaction, depending on on the exact um, alcohol we're talking about. 
and then it can be done again. And if you have excess acid, you can then protonate that. So you took the ether and you turned it into an alcohol. So the first half of this is exactly the same as is the exactly the reverse of the Williamson ether synthesis. We're going to take the ether and turn it into an alcohol. And the second step is that alcohol can be protonated as well. And if that alcohol is protonated, now it's water and it's a good leaving group and you can do the same thing, SN1 or SN2, depending on the alcohol. All right, so it would look something like this. Proton transfer to protonate the oxygen. Leaving group leaves or is replaced by SN2 and leaves at the same time. Because once, once we protonated that oxygen, that's a good leaving group. That's a stable molecule on its own. And stable molecules make, make good leaving groups. So we just needed something to come in and replace it. So if it's primary, it goes through an SN2. If it was tertiary, it would be an SN1, where it, would, it could leave first, and then your halide could come in and attach. But it's going to go through a substitution either way. And then we're left with an alcohol and an alkyl halide, which can then do the exact same thing. That same alcohol can then be protonated again, the same oxygen, be protonated again, and do the exact same two steps, proton transfer, SN2, proton transfer, SN2. Hopefully, you guys are starting to see patterns with these as far as you do a lot of proton transfer and then follow the nucleophiles, right? Where, what's a good leaving group? What's a good nucleophile? And so for a, a lot of these mechanisms, knowing, knowing where you're going is half the battle. Because if I didn't tell you where to go, if it didn't say excess, you wouldn't know that you were supposed to then keep going and do, go through a second substitution step, right? It would seem like stopping here would make a lot of sense. But that whole having excess strong acid means that we're going to continue protonating it. And if you continue protonating it, you're going to have this happen twice. So basically, we can't control very well where to stop for a lot of these two-step reactions. If we start in the middle, we can go to all the way towards the ether. But if we start from the ether, from the end, we're, we can't stop halfway. We're going to wind up doing both of the substitutions because in order to get the oxygen to leave one of the carbons, we have to have enough acid and nucleophile around that, that it's going to leave from both of the carbons. So let's practice with these. You don't have to draw the mechanism, but it might be helpful. Um, all of these are excess. I'm only going to do the top row to work through them. Um, I'll give you guys a few minutes head start.
All right, so for this first one, for all of these with these acidic cleavages, we're just gonna break the oxygen bonds. Water is gonna be our product for all of them. That's not, not the most important product. So for all of them, we're going to need to, we're gonna break both carbon oxygen bonds and whatever's left over, wherever the oxygen was, we're gonna attach the relevant um, alkyl halide. So for this first one, we have an isopropyl or an isobutyl group on each side. And bromine is our halide. So we just break the, the ether up, put the bromine in. So it's, it's a cleavage reaction, but as far as our cleavage reaction goes, this one's actually a lot simpler than ozonolysis, right? Ozonolysis was a real pain to keep track of where everything was and where the double bonds should be. No double bonds here. You just replace the oxygen with, with the halide on both sides and you get two molecules. It's not always gonna be symmetrical. It is in this case. Casey? Yeah, Sean, I was gonna ask, so this can't go under rearrangement and have the bromine on the um, center card. So because the oxygen is attached to a primary carbon on both of these, it's not going to go through a carbocation intermediate. It's going to go SN2, that, sub, that one step substitution, which means that no rearrangements can happen. Um, and really, we would only see the SN1 happen if the alcohol was already on a tertiary, if the ether was already on a tertiary carbon, then it could go SN1. But in that case, there's not going to be any rearrangement because it's already on the most stable, the most stable carbocation. So not something we need to worry about for this one. Good catch, though. So if we start with this molecule here and we're going to break both carbon, carbon oxygen bonds and replace them with iodide in this case. We had, and if you're unsure about these ones, when it's the ring opening reactions, just remember to count your carbons. We only had four carbons to begin with. We still have four carbons. Casey, do you have another question? Okay, I'll lower your hand then. Last but not least, we have to deal with a benzene ring. Benzene rings don't go through SN2 reactions, right? So this might be a case where we're going to stop halfway through. So first thing that happened would be we'd protonate the alcohol. That gives us a good leaving group. We have to decide which, which way it's going to leave. We're not going to, bromine is not going to attack the benzene ring to displace the oxygen. Benzene rings don't go through SN2. So we're actually going to stop at phenol. And again, Molview just doesn't automatically draw the hydrogen. You don't, you can draw it just as OH, but Molview doesn't do that for me. So I have to draw the H in by hand. And then on the other side, we'll get the ethyl bromide. All right, so because it's a benzene ring, it does not go through both steps of that acidic cleavage. Other than me throwing benzene at you that you weren't expecting, how did that go? Not too bad, right? It's just one more thing, one more piece of vocab, essentially, that you have to learn. It's not any new mechanism steps, though. 
And again, this is these are the sections where OCAM gets its reputation as being really hard because if you jumped right into chapters like this without spending the time we did on mechanisms to begin with, this just feels like memorizing. Um, and it is memorizing to a fair extent, I realize that, but not as much, at least you know the logic behind why it's happening. Um, the old school way of teaching OCAM was to jump straight into reactions like this at the very beginning. And you just started memorizing pages and pages of reactions before you ever touched mechanisms. And that never made sense to me. So I recognize there's a lot of memorizing still, but at the same time, um, it should make sense at least, at least when I'm doing it. And it will make sense as you keep practicing it. Um, we will, we can come back and finish these after, after break, if there's demand or um, if you guys, if you want to uh, do them and come to office hours later, um, I'll go over them with you too. But these are more fun. I like the sequential reaction steps, right? So we get to practice a bunch of reactions at the same time. So let's go through these as a good review here. And again, I will give you a few minutes to get a head start on me.
All right. So for these sequential reactions, it can be helpful to, when you've got a whole bunch of steps in a row, it can be really helpful to break them up into what are the types of reactions you're dealing with. And you may have seen me doing that for some of these. Um, for instance, O3 and DMS, that's really one reaction. Remember that ozonolysis requires both of those steps. Just exposing it to ozone makes ozonide, which is that weird five-sided ring where you've got a bunch of oxygens involved. So you need it to be exposed to DMS, which is a mild reducing agent. Sorry, mild oxidizing agent, um, which is weird because we're not really changing the number of carbon oxygen bonds. Um, but it's going to turn it into those carbonyls in this case. And then the second step, the lithium aluminum hydride followed by H2O, that's really one reaction too. That's your hydride reduction. Your hydride attacks the carbonyl carbon in the water just as a proton source. So for A and B, it's the same two reactions in sequence. For A, we're gonna get Again, count your carbons. We're going to get six carbons. So one, two, three, four, three, four, five, six. And at each end was an aldehyde. And it seems like we added something there, right? Because breaking that ring structure and then replacing it with two oxygens, we did add two heavy atoms, two non hydrogen atoms. But if you count your carbons, we still just have the six carbons. So it looks like a bigger molecule because it is, but we didn't add any carbons. Then the second step was the lithium aluminum hydride reduction. So we take each of these and convert them to an alcohol. So we wind up with one six hexane diol. Um, I don't think I mentioned it when we were going over naming alcohols, but if you have two alcohols on the same molecule, it is a diol, D-I-O-L. I think I mentioned it back last quarter, maybe even at the beginning of this quarter. So, and we just name that as the alkane, just say hexane diol, or you say even say hexane one six diol, or you can put the one six in front. And we're gonna get very, very similar steps for the for B, it's just only with four carbons. That's just fine. And so we wind up with one, two, oh, that's my eraser. One, two, three, four, OH, OH. So that would be butane one, four diol or one, four butane diol. The names start sounding a little bit more awkward as we start adding more, more rules, but they still follow the same rules, right? Or they, they get more awkward as we add more functional groups. Um, but th that uh, the fact that they still follow the same rules means that it's very it's still very systematic and you know, go with your instinct at this point because you guys are getting pretty good at doing nomenclature, right? So if you've got two of something and you want to say that you have two of something, put a Put a dye in there. Um, instead of hexanol, it's hexane diol. <laughs> the second one's an interesting, or the third one rather is an interesting one because we have a Grignard reaction, then an oxidation, then another Grignard reaction. So the first Grignard reaction is gonna take this three carbon fragment and we're gonna add an ethyl group where the carbonyl is, right? And that turns the carbonyl into an alcohol. So after step one and two, we get the 
the secondary alcohol. We go from an aldehyde to a secondary alcohol. So then what the, what the oxidizing agent does is it takes that alcohol and turns it back to a carbonyl again, right? Because all of our oxidizing agents, chromate, dichromate in particular is a really easy one to remember um, because dichromate just, you re remove every hydrogen from the active carbon and replace it with an oxygen bond. So if it's a primary alcohol, it, go, it reacts all the way to a carboxylic acid. It's a secondary alcohol, then you get um, a ketone. If it's a tertiary alcohol, there is no hydrogen to be removed, so it doesn't react. So this is actually, since chromate is actually a, um, or sorry, dichromate, it has color to it. This is actually a, um, tests that can be done to determine what type of alcohol you have. If you have an alcohol, you know it's an alcohol based on solubility um, or based on other clues, but you don't know if it's primary, secondary, or tertiary, you just expose it to dichromate. If you get an acid, which you can find by measuring the pH at the end, then it must be a primary alcohol. If it reacts and the chromate disappears, but you don't get an acid, it must be a secondary alcohol. If it doesn't react at all, it must be a tertiary alcohol. And if it turns all black and gunky, it must be a phenol because phenols behave very differently than the rest of the alcohols. And that's, that's my takeaway from um, Oakwall when doing this test was um, you just got a weird, it was kind of like a really deep purple, but also sort of gunky, like, like tar um, when you expose dichromate to phenols. So, this is actually a fairly common reaction and remembering that it goes as far as it can. So your, key, so your secondary alcohol is going to get turned to a ketone after step three. And then we have another Grignard reagent. So this is a way to, that's a good way to take an aldehyde and turn it all the way to a tertiary alcohol is add a Grignard reagent, reoxidize it, add another Grignard reagent. And we're going to add a second ethyl group. And it starts looking like a bacteriophage. All right, so when you've got a whole bunch of these steps in a row, it can be advantageous as well to when you're chunking it up by this, this reaction, this reaction, draw your product and then ignore what you just did. Once you get the product from the first two steps, they don't matter anymore. And that's a way to kind of remind yourself, okay, one step at a time, don't, don't get too bogged down in, in all of the sequence, one foot in front of the other, so to speak, one carbon in front of the other. All right, for D, got our hydride source followed by water. So these first two steps, we're going to take that aldehyde and turn it into an alcohol. Nothing else is changing after the first two steps. So then once we get there, and then we hit tosyl chloride in pyridine, that's not one that we've used a whole bunch, right? That's one that we might want to go back and check, especially given that um, this is good. You're going to be open book tests. Go to your reaction summary and go to your reaction summary for alcohols because we know that this is now an alcohol. So it doesn't matter how we got to the alcohol. Go to your reaction summary for alcohol. We have an alcohol plus tosyl chloride and pyridine, which and I'm just going to the review of the reactions. 
I'm going to not get rid of that. Let's see if I can make sure. There we go. SN2 reactions with alcohol. So we're going to be substituting it somehow. So this just says tosyl chloride and pyridine followed by bromide. So what is the tosyl chloride doing? Why do we have to do this? If, if this was to replace an alcohol with a bromide, we don't have the second step here. What is the TS doing? Does anybody remember? Yeah, you're just turning the uh, alcohol group into a better leaving group, right? Right, and then we're stopping. It's not going further than that. So we're gonna stop at the good leaving group, which we just represent with OTS. Um, and if you go back into the section where it starts talking about substitution reactions of alcohols and I lost where that one was. Um, it, it walks you through this step. It's a preparation of alcohol. We want to get out of that. Um, it just is represented as OTS. It's in. It's buried in the middle here somewhere. Yeah, probably in the. Um, but it is a review as well because we covered this back when we were first doing, when we were doing substitutions. There we go. It's going to be in here somewhere. There's our good leaving group, which is written as OTS. So before another nucleophile is exposed, we're just going to stop at the OTS. All right, what do we get for the last one? What are our, our reaction steps, our overall reactions? What's our the what's gonna happen here? Gonna make an alcohol first. Gonna make an alcohol first. We got acid catalyzed hydration, right? Which normally we'd be worried about rearrangement, but all of our carbons are secondary. So after step one, we get cyclopentanol. And then dichromate, right? Dichromate's an oxi our strong oxidizing agent. So dichromate is going to take this and turn it into the more oxidized form the ketone. The rest of this stuff here plays a role in the mechanism, the sulfuric acid in the water. But realistically, what we care the most about is the, the oxidizing agent. As soon as you see dichromate, boom, think oxidizing agent. All right, and then, then we have another Grignard reagent followed by water. So we've got, and it's a phenyl magnesium bromide. So we're going to attach a benzene ring to the same carbon that has the carbonyl. And I'm gonna clear all this so that I can fit everything. So we're doing our carbonyl, turning it to an, an alcohol once again. and attaching a, brom a uh, phenyl group there. And as you are doing these reactions, sometimes if the when you're adding a phenyl group, you can actually abbreviate it pH when you're adding it on there. If you're going to the trouble of drawing one of the ring structures, though, you should probably draw both ring structures. But if you're in a, con you know, in a crunch for space, you could draw this product as
pH for phenyl. Or occasionally you even see it written as the, not Greek letter, I'm trying to think what the name of that, I think it's Scandinavian or something. It's the O in Bronsted. That O with a line through it sometimes gets used to represent a benzene ring when you are short of space or feeling lazy. So it will sometimes be just written as ideally more a, a smaller O with a line through it and neater looking. And again, that's really that's really informal. You wouldn't want to do that on anything necessarily that you were turning in, but as you're writing notes and you want to go fast to draw a benzene ring, that's an acceptable way to do it. All right, so pretty good review, right? Nothing with these alcohols. I mean, we, we added some new rules with the alcohols with reductions versus oxidation, but they still kind of follow our rules, follow the negative charges. Negative charges are attracted to positive charges. And then what happens next, right? So reduction reactions, especially the oxidation reaction, the, the chromate dichromate, that one we don't have a mechanism for because a lot of times with these oxidation reactions, they go through really complicated mechanisms um, because metals can do things like, like give away one electron at a time. And so they wind up being more complicated than we want to get into for this class. Let's see. Let's see if we want to go through this or take our break a little bit early. Probably we'll. Um, so we've talked a little bit about epoxides, mostly in the context of making diols though, right? Mostly in, in those dihydroxylation reactions, epoxide was sort of a halfway step. Um, but they do have their own set of reactions to some extent, although most of those reactions are going to be centered around um, ring opening reactions because these epoxides are um, are so unstable. And they're, they're named in a pretty predictable way. We just use the prefix epoxy. Um, sometimes you see them called oxiranes, or sometimes you, you just see them called oxides, like ethylene oxide is, is, ethene, is ethane with an epoxide on it. Um, but our, with our systematic naming system, we just go the same route as normal, find your longest continuous carbon chain. And then you just add the prefix epoxy if there's an epoxy group in there. And you specify where the epoxy group is, which two carbons are attached, which is a little bit different than the alkene where we would just say, um, we would just say two epoxy. Um, partly because the oxygen is, is not by definition, if it's an epoxide, it's by definition between carbon two and three, um, but you could have a, a cyclic ether that was be not between carbon two and three. So they specify both numbers for these, but this is really getting into um, sort of the, the minutia of, of nomenclature. I'm not gonna be, this is not a big functional group as far as nomenclature goes. So I'm more worried that you could name a diol than an epoxide. Um, but there is some practice here. And so for most of these, we'll do this section, and then we'll take our break. For most of these, the, again, the, trick is find the longest continuous carbon chain that has the epoxide, that has your functional group on it. So for A, that's pretty easy. There's only three carbons, right? So that's going to be epoxy propane.
And just when in doubt, you might as well put the numbers in there, one, two, epoxy propane. And then, but we still have a branch as well. And so we'd say two methyl. And the methyl is a little redundant, or sorry, the two on the methyl is a little redundant because otherwise it'd be a butane. Um, but again, one in doubt, it's better to be overly specific and redundant than to not put a number where you needed it. Um, in this case, with this simple of a molecule, you could probably just say methyl epoxy, epoxy propane. And there's really no other way it could be arranged, right? Because the epoxy is always, if it's a propane group, the epoxy is always going to be between carbons one and two. And if it's propane, a, any methyl group has to be on carbon two. But again, better safe than sorry with the numbering. E is tricky. How long ago did I miss something in the chat? Um, you can have the R and the S when naming these, although you still have to watch out for meso compounds. I assume, Casey, you're looking at that C. C is going to have that internal mirror plane. So this one's going to be a meso compound, meaning there is no RS. But if there was an extra methyl on one side versus the other, then the, then the mirror image is not going to be the same compound. And then we would want to name R and S. Um, for B, the trickiest part about it is not stereochemistry. It's the fact that our longest continuous carbon chain that has the epoxide is only two carbons long. So we have to name this as epoxy ethane. And then we name both of the benzene rings as branches. And remember, when you're using benzene ring as a branch, it's a phenyl group with a YL. So this would be 1, 1 diphenyl epoxy ethane. Do we need the numbers for diphenyl? Is there another way they could be arranged? With the di, when you have di on there, that usually means you need to be more careful with your numbers because you could have one, two diphenyl epoxy ethane, right? If your phenols were on opposite carbons. So we do want to specify one, one diphenyl epoxy ethane. We don't need to specify the numbers for the epoxy group because it's ethane. There's only two carbons on ethane, so there's only two carbons for the epoxy group to be bonding between. Then last but not least, epoxy cyclohexane. The parent molecule cyclohexane, and it has an epoxy group. And again, don't really need to specify a number on the epoxy because an epoxy group is between carbons one and two if it's on a ring structure. We don't really need to specify cis either because there's no other way you could attach an epoxy 
right? You can't have an epoxy attached to the top of the ring and the bottom of the ring simultaneously because the oxygen can't be in two places at once. Right, so that one's a pretty straightforward one to name. And again, if it had a methyl group here where you didn't have that internal mirror plane, then we might need to worry about um, R versus S. And that's going to get tricky because now we have, it, on paper at least, we have three stereo centers. You have the methyl, the carbon that has the methyl on it, plus you have each of the two carbons on the, um, in the epoxide. So, in the interest of uh, being thorough, you probably would want to name all three of those R versus S and just start. Here's carbon one, here's carbon two, here's carbon three. So then your name would be something like, let's see, one, one S, two R, one, two, three R, three methyl epoxy cyclohexane. When you have all these ring structures attached to another ring structure, you're limited. If, if one is S, then two has to be R if it's cis. Um, so it seems a little redundant, but without having a, a unique name for this compound, again, it's better to be redundant than to leave something out. And again, if you have, if you assign the stereochemistry R versus S for all three of those stereocenters, you shouldn't need to say cis. Because the only way you get this combination, 1S, 2R, 3R, is if they're all on the same side of the molecule. So this is more specific than saying cis versus trans. And so with that in mind, you don't need to say cis versus trans. All right, let's go ahead and take our break. Let's come back at uh, let's come back at five after.
All right, start coming back here in a second, a minute or two early. So while everybody is getting back here, um, I don't have to worry about this from you guys so much, but uh, this is a very, very common question asked to professors when um, from first year students. I didn't come to class last week. Did I miss anything? Um, and uh, so this just popped up on one of my feeds at some point in the last week, and I thought it was worth sharing. I don't take that question quite as personally as other people, probably because I wasn't as good at going to class when I was a student. But um, some professors take it really personally when you ask, did I miss anything? All right, and if you didn't get a chance to read the whole thing, I'll put the link in there. Um, I'm thinking about adding that to my syllabus for, for uh, Chem 100, since they're the worst offenders about asking that, a quest that question um, without a good reason for being gone. Um, and it, I suppose in other unrelated, um, be a good student news, should make PSA, don't use Chegg. There are ways to use Chegg that are not cheating, but they're few and far between. Um, and Chegg just makes my life a lot more complicated than I want it to be. Um, so just, just don't do it. You guys are good enough students. You can learn it without using Chegg. So please don't use Chegg. Um, plus, yeah, I wouldn't even work for Chegg. You, they get paid like $2.50 per question which means to make something like $15 an hour, you've got to be answering like 10 questions an hour, just about. Actually, if you could answer 10 questions an hour, then, then you'd be making decent money, but pretty much can't. Can you imagine doing Gen Chem homework and answering 10 questions an hour for somebody else to get paid, you know, $15 an hour, $20 an hour? It's just not worth it because they're just going to turn in your work is cheating anyway. Just become a tutor if you want to do if you want to do uh, chemistry work or school work for pay. Become a tutor or a teacher. Anyway, um, so this is just review of how we would make an epoxide. Um, the the standard way we make an epoxide is to use that peroxy acid, which winds up adding it in the cis position because it's an epoxy that has to be cis. You can do this another route. Um, this is less common. The way that I would, I would look for it, be, this is your, your clue. We only use peroxy acids for one thing at this point. Peroxy acid makes an epoxide. Right, so that's what I would be looking for. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about historical chemistry. This guy's got a funny looking picture on Wikipedia. His name is Barry Sharpless. Um, and he won a Nobel Prize because he was actually able to show that instead of making the racemic mixture, instead of making a 50-50 mixture of these two compounds, um, if you use the catalyst that was chiral, you favored one compound over the other. So he was actually able to take a mechanism that's normally gives you a 50-50 mixture of the R and the S. And he was able to show that you can get, you can preferentially make one chiral molecule over another. 
Um, and so if you add a catalyst, if you have a reaction that, that has the blue line is with no catalyst, if you use a chiral catalyst, you can lower the transition state for one of the transition states relative to the other, which means you will make the red enantiomer faster than you make the green enantiomer. So the, the practical effects, I believe Sharpless taught at uh, UCSD. I think he's still, he might still be teaching at UCSD. Um, and so he actually had, and his, his Nobel Prize winning research, the first place he demonstrated this was with an epoxide. Um, and so he was able to use this titanium tetraisopropoxide with these, he was able to bond it to these other two molecules called DET. Um, and these DET molecules are chiral and they bound to the titanium catalyst in such a way that they, they made the catalyst itself chiral by bonding to the titanium isopropoxide. And if you use the plus form, then you get one stereoisomer. And if you use the minus form, you get the other stereoisomer. Um, and it, it's a very specific reaction. It's not a universal reaction. It only happens if you have a, um, an alkene that has an oxygen one carbon away from the alkene. So it's not an enol um, where you have your oxygen attached to the alkene. It's one carbon away. You need both pieces of this have to be there at the same distance apart um, because it's such a specific trend, um, specific shape of the catalyst. Um, but he was able to, to show that, that you added the oxygen either to the top or the bottom preferentially, depending on which of these molecules you used. So less, right, so and we have some, some tips for this. It's always going to be a very specific reaction. Um, but it is one that shows up and this, this same idea applies to other reactions. This has since been expanded to a lot of different reactions. Um, but historically, this was the first one in the way that we predict which version we make is you always set it up regardless of what the different R groups are. You set it up with your alkene being flat into the board and out of the board. And you put your oxygen on the back right corner. If you set it up that way, the DET plus stereoisomer will add the oxygen to the top side, and the DET minus form will add the oxygen to the bottom side. And with pretty good stereospecificity, 98% of the time, so you still get a tiny amount of the other enantiomer. Um, but that's a that's pretty specific. That's pretty good selectivity. And so the this comes into play because the next thing that happens with these epoxides is usually that we open the ring structure. And so you're going to be able to control which product you make, which enantiomer you make by using this form instead of just using a peroxy acid to make your um, your epoxide, if you use the DET form, the titanium isopropoxide with DET, you can make just one of them. It's not plus EN. So let's practice this because this is tricky. Remember, for all of these, it only happens if you have, you need the, the catalyst has to be there and the catalyst determines which form we make, set it up with the alkene being flat into the board and out of the board with your oxygen on the back right corner.
So for the for A, rotate it up so that the the ring is flat, sticking into the into the screen and out of the screen. And that automat that will put the oxygen in the back right corner. And then look down at the bottom. Where you've got the plus. The plus tells you it goes on top. Right. And the the meth or the carbon that has the oxygen attached to it will always therefore be the on the opposite direction of the epoxide that forms. Here we've got a minus. So if we set it up properly, the epoxide will go. Um, Toward the bottom side. So when we rotate this thing around, this molecule around, we need the oxygen to be in the back right corner. So we could start by flipping it over like a pancake. And we'd get that molecule, right? And then if we take that and we rotate it up so that it's flat and put the, the epoxide down, we would get and we're breaking the pi bond to do it. All right, so the trickiest part is remembering you put your oxygen in the back right corner and then plus goes on top, minus goes on bottom. So for D, we took that molecule and rotated everything 90 degrees. We'd get this, which we could then tip upward to look at it head on. And we'd see that the, we need the epoxide and we have a minus DET. So our epoxide would go down. And then for C, start by rotating it so that your oxygen's in the top right, and then flip it on its side. Breaking the pi bond, and it's a plus. That means our epoxide is coming out towards us. It's a very, this is a 
I'm, I'm going to go with the taken reference, I think, is our analogy here. This is a very specific reaction. It's very useful for certain people in certain situations. Um, but it also is a way to remind you these are 3D molecules and we need to um, pay, pay attention to their orientation sometimes for when we're making these reactions, when we're drawing our products. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one, the, the easy thing about epoxides is that they really only go through one type of reaction. Once you make the epoxides, they're always going to go through the, I guess I shouldn't say always, 90% of the time what follows is that the ring opens. And it almost always is going to open following an SN2 mechanism because you've got a really good leaving group in that epoxide, right? A carbon oxygen bond is not that weak, but you have a, it's that strained epoxide ring structure that makes it so that you can bring in something from the backside and your leaving group leaves. So if you start with ethene epoxide, or sorry, epo epoxy ethane, and you bring in um, and you bring in hydroxide, that hydroxide is just going to act as a nucleophile, your leaving group leaves, and you wind up with that ring opening, and then you just need a quick proton transfer to make it neutral. Um, so again, we, we saw this as a way to make a dihydroxylation, and that's, that's going to continue to be the case here. This is um, if we have hydroxide as our nucleophile, we're going to make a diol. But we could have anything else as a, that's a strong nucleophile could be there too. So we could make an ether and an alcohol right next to each other if we had, say, a methoxy ion acting as our nucleophile. Hmm. Let me fix that. All right, so the normally an ether is not that great of a leaving group. It's an okay leaving group. We can get it to go through a leaving group reaction, um, but because of the strain energy, it makes it a lot easier. It's, if we look at a regular ether being replaced by a hydroxide and acting as a leaving group, um, it's pretty uphill in energy to get to that transition state energy. But if we start from the epoxide, it starts out so much less stable because of the strain energy that it's one, it's up, it's uh, easier to get to the activation state. And plus, we actually can be making something more stable by opening that ring, even if it's something that's charged that normally we would think of as being pretty unstable. But we're breaking up something that was even less stable. Um, so here's some common nucleophiles that are used with epoxides. If you have a, any, any alk oxide ion, so this could be a methyl group, an ethyl group, um, any alk oxide ion can act as a nucleophile. Um, cyanide ions, this is a, thi a thiol ion or a sulfide ion, which we'll talk about probably next lecture. Um, you can have a Grignard reagent act as your nucleophile. You can have a hydride act as your nucleophile. So this actually is a, making an epoxide winds up being a really good way to turn an alkene into a longer chain. Because if you have an alkene and you make an epoxide, then you can come in and, and attach any R group you want basically to it if you use a Grignard reaction.
So what would the reaction look like if we started from this epoxide? had cyanide act as a nucleophile and then protonated it. What's our first step going to be here? Your nucleophile attacking one of the carbons in the epoxy, maybe the one with the hydrogen, opening up the ring structure. Good, why did you pick that carbon? Just because it's steric, so it looks like it'd be easier to access it. Exactly. Sterics mean it's easier for the cyanide to get into and attach to the uh, less sterically hindered side of the epoxide. So we'll start by, let's leave everything where it is, except what we have our ring opening and then we had to break a bond to make room for it. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. There we go. And then on the other side, because it goes through that SN2, because it's a backside attack, we wind up with those, the hydrogen and the ethyl group flipping upward. So we wind up with the hydrogen is still facing out towards us, but it's now up. The ethyl group is into the board and kind of up behind the, the hydrogen. And then what's step two? Just what type protonate. of step is it? What's that? Going to protonate the oxygen. Add a proton. Proton transfer step from the water is going to add an, an H to our oxygen here. So. We want to pay attention to our stereochemistry with these because it is going through an SN2. Um, unless I specifically ask you to name this, you don't have to go through and assign R versus S to each of these. But if you didn't, if you had your cyanide in the wrong place on your product, that's not going to be the right, the right product, right? You have to show the stereochemistry on your product to get this 100% right even if I'm not asking you to show the mechanism. But the mechanisms, you should be hoping for this as a mechanism on the next test, right? This is a pretty short, pretty intuitive mechanism at this point. Nucleophile attacks and leaving group leaves followed by a proton transfer. We've seen that a half dozen times this chapter alone. And we have some more practice. Let me see what's coming up and if I want, if we should spend. Mm. 
Mm, 20 minutes left on a Thursday. We're not going to get through all of Thiols, so we might as well spend the time and do these. We have, and then we have one more version of the ring opening reaction to look at. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes to work on these, and then work, we'll walk through them. So for all of these, the same process we just went through, the only thing that's going to change is what's our nucleophile. So this first one, the oxygen, the side that ends up with the oxygen is not a stereo center, so it's not that critical. But for the sake of consistency, probably want to show the oxygen pointing that same direction, although it's going to be opened up into that real tetrahedral structure. Then you wind up with the methyl group and the hydrogen that's not drawn, which is hard to get mole view to do that properly, wind up being pushed upward. And you're because your phenyl group is coming in and attaching, your phenyl Grignard reagent is coming in and attaching opposite of your oxygen. Which means C, I think these all do these all have the same, they do all have the same reactant. Um, the only thing that's changing with any of these is what's our nucleophile. So in this case, we haven't dealt much with sulfur, but it's more electronegative than carbon, right? Behaves a lot like oxygen in a lot of ways. And we'll see that in more detail coming up. If our nucleophile is a a um, sulfide, we just have that come in and attach here. Casey? Yeah, Sean, I was going to ask, um, is it attacking the side with the methyl because it's more stable? No, you are correct. It should be going to the other side because it's more, because there's less sterically hindered. Thank you. So our oxygen winds up being, so here's our, starting molecule. It's a start like this. And I just picked the wrong side for some reason. I wasn't paying attention. 
we're breaking that bond. The oxygen moves over and our phenyl group attaches to this side. Again, it's going to wind up with a CH2 in the middle, so there's no stereochemistry where the benzene ring is attached. The stereochemistry is going to be on the side that has the oxygen in this case. Another question, Casey? Or I keep forgetting to put my hand down. That's okay. I wasn't sure if I remembered to put your hand down for you or not, and if you just put it back up. So, <laughs> um, so again, all that's changing now is that for C, is it's not a benzene ring attached. It's going to be this sulfur. It's it, what's called a thi a thioether. It looks like an ether, except you have a sulfur instead of an oxygen. And anytime you've got a sulfur where an oxygen would normally be, we use the prefix thio, T-H-I-O, means that it's sulfur. So this is a thioether. And we'll, like I said, we'll go, we'll spend more time on sulfur um, next class. Uh, let's look at the other side again. All of the same considerations for B, we have cyanide being attached. So instead of, we are going to wind up with what's known as a nitrile. And nitrile is when you have carbon triple bonded to a nitrogen as part of a organic group. It's a also called a, a cyano group because you're attaching cyanide, um, which once again, I'm, I was uh, geeking out over the chemistry of that Poisoner's Handbook book. The, the, uh, where they, the reason cyanide is named cyanide is because it's the primary component in um, the paint color Prussian blue, which if you watch any Bob Ross or do any painting, you've probably heard that referred to. Prussian blue is a result of, um, of this, I think he was Dutch, maybe Danish, one of those Northern, Northwestern European countries. Um, this uh, painter who went into his chemist friend's lab and his chemist friend just let him mix random stuff together to see what color he would get. And he took something that was red and he mixed it all together in a way that um, he made Prussian blue, which if then you add it to acid and you heat it, you get cyanide, um, hydrogen cyanide gas being generated. Um, so it's cyanide is actually named after the color cyan because it's blue or it comes from Prussian blue anyway. Um, let's see, it was probably Dutch because I think the Prussian empire owned the Netherlands at that time, if I had to guess. But then again, they might've also owned Denmark at that time for all I know. I think Denmark was still independent though. I don't know, Russian his or uh, European history gets really complicated around the you know, 16, 1700s. All right, last but not least, what do we get if our nucleophile is a hydride? That one's the easiest one. In that case, we lose the stereochemistry because we have two identical methyls attached, right? We have two methyls attached that we can't tell the difference between. Oops. We're just going to get isopropyl alcohol. There's a different version of these ring opening reactions that has the same net result, but if it's done under acidic conditions, we just wind up protonating the alcohol before the nucleophilic attack happens. Um, that makes an even better leaving group. So you don't even need a very strong nucleophile to attack. If you protonate that epoxide, your um, a halogen can come in and attack from the opposite side. 
Um, so it's not just limited to if you have a strong nucleophile, it also happens when you have a weaker nucleophile, but it has to be in acidic conditions. So let's practice drawing a mechanism here. It's acidic conditions, and it's not explicitly stated that it's acidic conditions, except that it says you've got H2SO4. If you've got a sulf sulfuric acid as a catalyst, you can assume it's acidic conditions. Ah. Keep trying to go too fast for my tablet to keep up with my annotations. But I think that's all relatively legible, right? First step is just you protonate the oxygen. Second step looks just the same as last time. Your nucleophile attacks, and it can be a weak nucleophile now. It doesn't have to be a strong nucleophile. So whatever you have that has a partial negative on it, the partial negative attacks the partial positive where your oxygen can leave. And again, the sterics are our primary, our primary um, decision maker as far as which oxygen it attacks. So the sterics would show we should expect our ethanol to attack the right-hand carbon. The secondary carbon instead of a tertiary carbon, it's easier for that ethanol to get in there. So that is going to look like We get an SN2 reaction happening. So on the left-hand side, we're going to get the ethyl and the methyl staying in the same spot. The oxygen from the epoxide sort of moves over that direction just to give it the, our overall tetrahedral shape. And on the right-hand carbon, the hydrogen and the, F and the ethyl group pop upward, and our ethoxy group is attached downward and to the right. So we wind up with
And at this point, you could stop drawing the hydrogen if you wanted to, since we don't usually show the hydrogens for um, skeletal structure. But in the interest of keeping track of all everything that's attached to those two carbons, it might not be a bad idea. So this was the result of the mechanism step that I just showed. And lastly, we're not going to leave it with a positive charge on that oxygen, so we need one more proton transfer step to remove that extra H+. So, and you can pick sort of anything that might be floating around that could be protonated, um, although usually makes the most sense to whatever your catalyst was, your acid catalyst that started the whole thing, have that be the base the conjugate base of that acid is what we would have act as our base in this case. So HSO4 minus to give us our final product of Reactions like this make it really obvious why organic chemists sometimes prefused, prefer to use uh, ET and ME instead of drawing even the condensed structure out um, for each of these. With methyls, it doesn't matter as much, but for the ethyl groups, it really saves you a lot of writing and makes it keeps it looking neater, keeps us focused on the reactive part of the molecule, not all of those carbons and hydrogens that we don't care about. Right, so ring opening reactions, nothing we haven't seen before, really. We're just spending time getting good at these mechanisms at this point so that we don't have a repeat of the mechanism section on the next test. And with that, you guys, you guys are caught up. I believe that's all we will cover for epoxides. And we'll pick up with thiols. And as you might expect, thioether is an ether with a sulfur instead of an oxygen. A thiol is an alcohol with a sulfur instead of an oxygen. So we will pick up with those, um, which will finish out chapter 13, I believe, on uh, Tuesday. Watch for a quiz, go live later. Um, oh, and I actually, I mentioned office hours. Uh, I should also be able to make office hours. Um, I can't hang around now, though, because I have to give a presentation in 10 minutes to a committee meeting. Um, so I've got to get going, but I will be in office hours at 1030. Other than that, everybody have a good weekend.